when he's going around doing inspections and food plants and this kind of thing. He's been eight years, eight years experience, a great technician, great guy, smart guy. So I, you know, we were doing this inspection. There's a tin cap back there, there's one before, we're going to the sanitation line, there's one here. And when he got there, I said, hey Jason, why'd you put it there? And there's this pregnant pause. And he said, what, what do you mean why did I put this here? I said, no, why, really, why did you put that there? Why did you put the one before that there? And it was silence, because he actually, same as me, on my route, he didn't have a really good scientific answer. He said, well, you know, that I think they want their spacing every 20 to 40 feet according to the ordering scheme. I said, yeah, but does the ordering scheme meet the scientific <coughs> behavior scheme? I, I don't know. So we don't know. But we're doing this by the millions. And I used to tell all my customers, rodents are blind or nearly blind, so they have to run the wall so they can take the whiskers and touch the wall so they feel safe as they run the wall so they feel safe and they'll follow the wall because they can't see very well. And so they warned my customers just like Curiosity Trap. Just like Curiosity Trap. So that's not true either. Three years, three years, every single customer. So now we know, as I'm going to show you, because finally we got around to testing this empirically, meaning measuring it with numbers that can be very statistically and pass through referees, and everyone can have a shot at it. Was there any flaw in the statistical design? Did you right, use the right model? Did you use the right? test to test the statistics of this particular blah blah blah. It goes on. Research is very sometimes cumbersome, drives you crazy. You use the wrong model. Someone says reject this paper, they use the wrong they use the wrong test for the blah blah blah. So we have to make sure statisticians, biostatisticians specifically were all over this is did you do it right? We did it right. You have to check with them. Well is that in a better spot than this? You better believe it is. Why? Shadow. Thank you. That word, there it is, boom, right back at us, in our face. That is a superior spot to that, it's a worthless spot. But, lo and behold, if that ends up being within the 20 to 40 foot range, many technicians, well, it's 25 feet, and it's 30 feet, I thought, it's got to go here. It's like, that's a big mistake. Yeah, the order that says, every 25 to 30, I said, forget the order. Do you want to protect this place or not? And call a meeting with the order that showed them the research. We'll do whatever we take, but to put it there is actually anti-food safety, anti-food safety. And the order then needs to hear that. But now we have proof that that's true. Well, we set out a couple of traps. One trap gets this bay, the other trap gets this bay. How does this go down? What's going to make you great? What's going to make you great so you get great results with great traps? Those are good traps. Those are very good traps. But it's not going to be what you use as bait. The bait is almost insignificant, except with one rule. And that is the best bait for every single trap when you go out to do mice or rats in a particular non-standard way is you do ask yourself, what did these rodents grow up on? In other words, what did they suckle from mom's milk? Because that's where their food preference starts. And some of you here may have been breastfed. Your brain started developing your food selection to your mom's milk, which she was eating. Your brain actually starts saying, okay, that molecule of carbohydrates, okay, that molecule of, of protein. All of us have what we have called comfort foods. Well, that's a comfort food to me. I guess I love that. I personally, I love a good macaroni and cheese. I have six brothers, two sisters. We were dirt poor. My mom and dad used to say, you know, we apologize, but it's macaroni and cheese for dinner. Again. Carries over to this day. My wife's like, Why, wow, you want to make macaroni and cheese this Sunday? I'm like, Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> like, can we do something a little sophisticated? I said, Yeah, but not this Sunday. <laughs> so, is this in the right spot or not? That's a horrible spot. So, this is Danny. I worked with Danny. This is a food warehouse. I said, Danny, why did you put this here? 
He said, well, Bobby, you know, look, you know, time is money. I got 17 stops to do and blah, blah, blah. If I have to go behind these bushes, that's a pain in the neck and it's really, you know, it's prickly and all of this stuff. And he said, they can come out here and feed on this. They said, no, they won't. No, they won't. He said, it's your job to put that where the rodents are going to feel safe in the shadows to feed from it. He said, if you're putting that there, that customer's not getting their money's worth from your service. I'm sorry. They're just not. But you're doing it because it's easy to reach. You're supposed to be doing it because the rodents have a preference for where they'll visit it in the shadows and security of that big bush. You can get back there. This was a big whole child chain. They got into a lot of trouble because they had mice started showing up in the rooms and so forth. I'm on the outside doing this big survey for six of their chains, six of their hotels, and as a random sample, and yah, yah, yah. And I, I'm like, what is this doing there? And every single station was clean as a whistle, bar barcoded, blah, blah, blah. It says that, that is not going to have high visitation rate, but if that was just moved 12 feet up here, bam! into the shadows of cover and feeling. And by the way, rodents have these special hairs on top of their heads. When they're below bushes and, and trees and this kind of thing, those hairs are meant to be triggered. Once they're triggered, the rodent feels safe. Now, there used to be a myth and say, well, if we put out a black box for food in it, they'll smell the bait inside that box. They'll smell it, and they will go in after the bait that they smell. That's not true. They don't go into those boxes till they smell the bait from a distance. Now, once they put their muzzle in here, if they are hungry and there is bait in there, then they'll smell that bait. But that doesn't even doesn't even mean they'll go in. Especially if around the bend, which it was, there's a dumpster. <coughs> They're like, well, that's interesting. After I do my dumpster, I do everything. I'm like, maybe I'll come back to you all. So. We published this paper, you guys, this year, just a couple months ago, it was out. Bill Robinson and I were just talking about this, for example. Finally, after all these years, you know, the name of the paper, Matt Fry, I think Matt spoke in here, I'm pretty sure, Dr. Matt Fry from Cornell, outstanding, outstanding scientist, you know, and Matt's constantly involved with rodents. Jody Gangwell Kaufman, who many of you, she's been here, she's, she's lectured about bed bugs and cockroaches and what have you. Myself, the Hank Hirsch, the Dave Bondi, this kind of thing, 2021. Assessment of factors influencing visitation to road control devices at food distribution centers. Now, this is about food distribution centers, but it could be any account anyone in this room has. You could go into any apartment kitchen if you want, in any apartment drum, you could go into a convenience store. Any account that you want to queue up. This principle applies to every one of your accounts. I say that with great confidence. But it went through the system. It went through the journal stored products research. It was like, hey, guess what? Now the auditing folks, most of them, seven out of eight of them pretty much say, yep, it should be assessment based. It's up to you, but you better know what you're doing. It's your job to protect this place. So in Pest Manager Magazine, in Pest Control Technology, you know, I don't know if Pest Manager is going to pick this up or run with it as well, Heather, but, you know, they, they picked it up and said, should it be placed or should it be spaced? This was October 15th, you know, when, when this news release went out, you know, for example, but basically it just shows that that next to that is critical no matter where the spacing ends up. Because that's leaking heat, that's leaking food odors, that's leaking possible pheromones that the first mouse or rat went in, and all of that, these need to be close together. Nothing complex about this. Well, here's just an excerpt from Cornell University in box and red here. In a new study, Fry and Jody, senior extension associate, and three co-authors who worked or consulted on it, blah, 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 discovered that traps placed near areas with attractive features like warmth and shelter, by the way, we had 12 other ones, captured more rodents while more than half the traps put out in the standard program put nothing. Bill and I were chatting in the hall earlier today, and Bill said, you know, these kinds of evolutions into new technology, true knowledge, game changers. Game changers for us today. And you're going to hear from the other speakers and from each other, all kinds of doubling the knowledge curve revolution is going on like this. To me, quite honestly, just like I'm going to mention in a second about sensing, 
Uber, U-P-E-R. Now, I can't imagine a single person in this room that has not learned that Uber works. First time I used Uber years ago, I'm like, this has got to be a dream. Because I travel a lot. I mean, I was in the middle of nowhere in New Zealand one time and missed my, uh, my travel back to, to the Auckland. And I said, there's no way Uber's going to be out here, but I'll try. I, I put Uber in. I'm like, we'll be here in 17 minutes. There's a guy who worked out of his garage down the road. I'm like, this is unbelievable. That guy got five stars and telling me a big tip. So it's a case of this kind of information as we have offered this is Uber. Here's just something simple out of that study. You can read, I hope you read up on this in your own. But dense vegetation provides cover for rodents to forage. No brainer, right? Like duh. But yet, some technicians will put the base station out where it sounds easy to get to for themselves. So they can get more stops done that day. Like you better talk to your boss, it's not about getting more stops done, it's about getting quality stops done. Some of you guys, when we talk about this whole business of going through this evolution, we have to keep in mind roads, of course, are complex pets. That's the stage I've tried to set, you know, by just showing you they're just not little varmints that have behaviors that are routine and they follow walls and that they're curious and that if they smell the bait, they go in. It's never been that simple. But we didn't have the knowledge curve back then. For city rodents, especially, I would love to put here in New York City, but I travel a lot and I see, I see this Chicago, San Francisco, Auckland, wherever. We have to dig deep, we have to think hard, we have to look far. And on the front end is when you want to nail that as hard as you can so you don't have the callbacks to eat the profit you make from every job. Because if you cut it back on the front end, chances are good you're going to eat it on the back end. And have unhappy customers that aren't going to break you up to all their friends and other businesses. Because you know, word of mouth advertising is the most powerful. Someone says, you know, you got to use this pest professional that's in Queens. They're unbelievably good. Blah, blah, blah. It adds up after a couple of years. Is that word being transmitted? Logarithmic. Right? Once we do this, then we install, then, underscore, then, we install, or maybe we even go back to an account, put more equipment into more impactful areas based on knowing your biology, behavior of these animals. Now, roughly about three weeks ago, thereabouts, because I'm in the field of life, I'm in the basement, I took this picture, I'm in the basement of a giant, giant, famous city marketplace in the East Coast. Right, I don't want to get, you know, talk about others where I, what have you. We're in the basement, they have a serious mouth problem, holy cow. And so it's a case, and we're down in the basement, we come across this block, and I said, I was with two technicians, I said, hey you guys, check it out. Check it out. Look at, look at this concrete hollow block here. Does anyone know what I'm getting all excited about? It's a concrete hollow block. Thank you, it's the rub marks. But why would, would there's a block, there's nothing in the block or on the block. But what, what's the big deal? Why are they marking that so heavy? What was that? Jumping on that and jumping up higher on the ledge. All right, excellent. All right, so this is the observational skill we're talking about that we pay for. So they can climb this, they can get here, and then from here to there. Now that's the first thing. There's something else at play here also. Let's go back to no cities, no towns, maybe some huts, maybe some utes. Let's go to Turkmenistan, the area where the house mouse evolved from. We could go to Mongolia where the Noi rat evolved from or came from. What do rodents do, just like many mammals do? We do. Many times, what do we do when we have a yard? You put up a fence. Not everybody, but a lot of people put up a fence. That's your turf, this is mine. Just to be certain, so you know, it's my yard. 
Don't come over here unless you're invited. Rodents in the wild didn't put up a fence. You just can't see it. They get on top of rocks in the wild, the highest rock nearby or something that's elevated off the ground. They lay down these grease marks, and in the grease marks are pheromones that waved out into the air and say, this is the Joan Mouse colony that occupies this area and the resources of this area. And if you're not from our Jones colony, do not come into here because we will go to war with you and kill you and eat you, if we can, unless you're stronger than us. Then you take us over. That is territorial marking. When you see this, notice right here, this is a very good company servicing. Now notice all this sequin here. This was an outstanding spot. The technician here with this company said, what do you think of my spot? There? I said, it's A++. If I was to give a grade on an exam at the university, you get A++. Because the sequin leaves to it, there's territorial marking, that's strong shadows, and boom. Although well, there's a mistake here. Anyone see the mistake? A little bit too eager in service. Tracking pattern. I'm like, what's what's with that? Is that for is that talcum? Is that I said, well, you know, it's really so bad here. We you know we're doing everything we can. I said, you can't put tracking powder out like that in a place that has food. It's like, well, why not? And I said, well, he's going in there. And I said, well, suppose he goes in here, gets halfway, says, no, we can play, we do, they go in. I said, you know what? I think I'm going to back up. And then wherever they go, we'll go that track and back. Can't do that. So, you guys, just so we know here, 30 strategically traps, 30 evenly spaced. This gets an F, this gets an A. The auditors would say, this is how we like it. Research will say, well, it's time to evolve with your ordinance scheme. So let me um, just attack this one principle, and then I'll take questions, keep us on time. And say you get an hour, that's it, the end of the wrapper, you're done. Right? So does anyone know what growing EAD stands for? Fairly new. EAD. I'm going to say this before I say it. It's one of the most important terms, I said this earlier, with, that you can pick up at this particular meeting because it's affecting all of you and you know it's actually affecting you. You just don't have an A for it yet. It's translated like this. These mice aren't touching any of my stuff. Or rats. Anyone have any of that? Come on. It's showing up all over. Is we're putting down equipment and then we're going back and checking it and we're not sure of like maybe there's no rodents in this area. How do you know that? Well, they didn't take the bait, they didn't take the trap. They didn't like, was it that they're not in the area or that they're just not going to interact with the equipment? EAD stands for rodent equipment aversion and disregard. This is a big deal scientifically. This is one of the hottest topics in my world right now. There's several published papers on this discussing that it's worldwide global and we're now the scientists that are geneticists are discovering that is a big genetic compound here. We used to say, oh, the rat didn't go in the base station because it is neophobic. It's afraid of that base station. It's new. We now know that that's probably not true, although there is some neophobic behavior that goes on, but now we know that a lot of rodents, if everything is working for them, anything new that shows up, they're disregarding like, I don't care what it is, I don't know what you put out, but I have a dumpster, I have a garbage can, I have a, a counter they don't clean, I'm not taking any chances with anything, I'm not afraid of it, I just don't need it, I don't care about it, go ahead and put it down, I'm ignoring it, disregarding it. Well, this is a couple weeks ago in a giant mall in New Jersey, and working with the quote, Ernie Skinky just there, who is one of the best pest control professionals in the East Coast, in my opinion. He's outstanding. And he said, Bobby, I've tried everything. I've tried everything, and I've, I've taken my traps, and I've preset them. I didn't, I gave them different kinds of food from this place where they were raiding the scraps on the floor, and what have you, and I smeared paper towels with the odor of what they were raiding on the floor, and I put them in the boxes that they were tearing up for nests, and in other words, I tried to say, this is what you're familiar with. 
So come on in, and, and there's no trap that's going to go off if you steal the bait. In other words, I'm going to train you to interact with these mouse traps. These are mice. Nothing. But the mice were there, and they were very active. They were totally disregarding this. Now, I see this in my travels as a scientist. I see this everywhere I go now. Over the past eight years, it's one of the most common reasons to say we have to hire a consultant with a PhD to come in here because we've got something really crazy going on and they're not touching the bait and blah, 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 can you help us? For eight years I've been working with EAT. I said, well, I may or may not be able to help you, but I can set out a plan. I'm going to tell you the plan's going to be a little bit painful. It's how much time it's going to take before you even set a trap. If the colony genetically is predisposed towards a disregard behavior. Like, you want us to do all that labor before we even start catching them? It's like, take it or leave it. What do you want me to do? Change the genetics of these animals? <laughs> well, here's back to that warehouse. It's just another classic case. I can show you so many slides of my work in the field. But this is a, a really good snack trap station. It's one, you know, you, you pull the cores and you see a color. And when you, that color disappears within the box, it means the traps have been set off and the rip cores have been pulled in and so forth. So the technician I was in at first said, we can keep going. That's one that didn't get any activity. I said, well, how do you know that? He said, Bobby, it's still set. You still see the yellow. It, when the traps have been caught or catch a mice, you don't see that. You know you got something. Or at least the traps are set off, so we can keep going. That's a great design. There's nothing wrong with it. I said, OK, OK, but just humor me. Let's open it up. There it is. They're still set. There was bait in both of these. These are wells. These are, you know, the original Kness snappies, a great trap and this kind of thing. And the well didn't have bait halfway up. Both of them taken clean without setting off the device. So this is not as simple as they're curious, 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 and we're going to catch them as soon as we set these traps. Not going to go like this. This is a really a dominant old Noe rat towards the end of his life, been around, seen some things. Right, been around and seen some things. So I want to just show you, you guys, that you know, here's a breeze through, and then I'm going to stop again because we have a long day ahead of us. You just went through over 20 product experts, which, as Andy said, pick their brains, pick their brains, right? There's just as important, if not more important, than any speaker you're going to hear, everybody's together in this kind of thing. But this is a world class of technology being transferred in this revolution we're going through. Right? So we have baits of all different types. I'm just going through this. But here's the thing. When people say we have great baits, <coughs> you do. You really have great baits. And we have new baits, new technology. But the seven most important words on every single bait label is that we remove as much alternative food as possible. The pandemic taught us when rodents don't have food in abundance, when everybody pulls up shop on all the streets of New York City, for example, the rodents ripped into every bait station was out there if the bait was fresh, even non-fresh bait. Every catch basin we had baited out of the city of New York department doing all these catch basins, all gone overnight. You get rid of the food, the animals are hungry. This animal has a low tolerance for being hungry, trust me. After just a day or two, rats and mice, when they're still hungry, they start looking to each other as food, and they rip apart each other. Your baits will never compete against that. There's a bait station underneath the stairs. It has fresh bait in it. The rats are running up and down this block, most of them feeding from this one property. There's not a bait station in the world that's going to save that block unless someone stops this. And there's bait stations, by the way, up and down that block people being charged, right? So we have these denticides, we have risk to the denticides, and I do want to stress, and now I'll take questions, this is a case where you better believe this looms big, again, as we said earlier, this looms very big for New York. This is coming, this whole business of, there's now bills being passed in, in different states. California was the first one, British Columbia just a couple weeks ago had a total ban on second generation anticoagulants. The European Union shut them down completely a couple of years ago. We are going to be confronting this in a very big way. But the main message here, if someone says, what are we going to do if we lose our baits? We better be back to this. 
I'm going to ask this group, as I end, how many of you feel like you're an expert with dumpsters? How many of you feel like you can give anyone a lecture on how to correctly use a dumpster or correctly do your garbage? With tips on your company's logo name. We blow right past that sometimes we stop putting out base safe saying, you know, it's a good bait because it has oil in it, and the oil helps against the trash. There's no oil bait that's going to beat out this. Not the rats we've grown up on. Okay? All right, so again, in the interest of time, you guys, I'm going to stop here. Uh, left a couple minutes, Sandy, for questions, unless you tell me no. You got six minutes, sir. All right, six minutes. This guy is on it. Okay. Questions? Yep, right here. All right, so I like the thing about the shadow. I'm new to the industry. First question is, 